Welcome back to Twin Flame Energy Podcast. I am your host, Dominique. And I am your co-host, AJ. This is podcast number 11. Master number 11. And the title of today's podcast is, What Are We Not Willing to Do for Each Other? Mm Mm-hmm. So why don't we jump right on in? Because we got a ton of information today. We do. We do. All right. All right. So the first article comes from uh, bustle.com. www.bustle. It's not like bust it. Like www.bustle.com. The title of this article is the worst things you can do in a relationship. There are 13 of them. Yes. No one ever said relationships are easy 100% of the time. Joining the lives of two people is almost always an exercise of patience, trust, and honesty, which aren't traits that come easily to everyone. In fact, many of us engage in habits that can be damaging to our relationships, oftentimes without even knowing it. If relationships are going to stand the test of time, they need to leave the door open to almost every conversation imaginable. This requires a deep sense of trust. So work on building that early and uh, and often in order to reach this level of openness. And while you're at it, read on for some habits and some definitely avoid. Bottling up feelings is number one. One of the most important aspects of any relationship is healthy and open communication. So try not to bottle up your feelings. Tis true, tis true. Number two is trying to be a mind reader. While mm. you know each other very well, don't assume you can read each other's minds. Right. You will always have the responsibility to ask for what you want, no matter how long you have been together. Mm-hmm. I thought you liked them. <laughs> And then three, never talking about the future. If you want your relationship. As you swat at our cat that's doing something. If you want your relationship to go down a healthy road and have long-term success, then you need, then you kind of need to talk about the future. If you and your partner avoid making to-do lists for the months and years to come, you may want to reconsider the stability of your relationship. Mm-hmm. She was about to unplug everything. Oh. And then <laughs> that's th- why. That little swatation was worth it. Yeah. That's, I was like, snap, snap. Okay. Number four, telling all sorts of white lies. Grand sweeping lies are obviously damaging to a relationship, but little white mm-hmm. lies aren't so great either. It may seem harmless to tell a little white lie or two on occasion, but it is important not to make a habit of it. Mm -hmm. Number five, calling your partner names. (laughs) Bearing an occasional slip up during a heated argument, you should never call your partner names. When a partner does this, the other partner either shuts down or gets defensive. And communication about the problem stop. Mm -hmm. Number six. Shutting your partner out, otherwise known as stonewalling. Shutting your partner out when you're feeling upset isn't a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get in your feelings, hurt, and shut off emotionally. But this is the kiss of death in a lot of relationships. Mm. Number seven is betraying your partner's trust. It's It's possible to ruin trust in many ways as with lying and name calling, but we all know the ultimate betrayal of trust has to do with being unfaithful, either physically or emotionally. And we also got to remember with that in terms of being unfaithful in a relationship is going to mean different things for different things. I mean, different things for different people. So Mm -hmm. there are some people who don't think stepping out of the marriage is being unfaithful, but that's because those are the ground rules they've set up in their relationship versus someone else might think, you saw that movie with who and you didn't see that movie with me that's being unfaithful Mm -hmm. that's how you think (laughs) if i go see a marvel movie with someone else don't you call that cheating but you wouldn't do that but if i did what that's your form of cheating no that's just stupid (laughs) (laughs) anyways number eight (laughs) see assumption (laughs) let (laughs) number eight letting them down constantly 
Again, there are plenty of ways that you can betray your partner that don't involve cheating. See? One of the biggest is being consistently unreliable and not following through with your commitments. Do you let your partner down in big ways every day? If so, it may be time to reevaluate things. Mm. And number nine, placing blame instead of owning your mistakes. After an argument, it can be tempting to place blame on your partner. And yet this habit can pretty darn damage, put damage to your relationship. It's much healthier to own your mistakes and talk about solutions together instead of pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. Get off my papers, Moon. She's, she's gone. Number 10, faking your way through SEX. While it's okay to fake it occasionally for the sake of your partner, you shouldn't let yourself get too caught up in this habit. Desire can be the key factor in building closeness in relationships. <laughs> Don't eat the, my papers. Can you hand me those papers, please? Uh, she is an active one tonight. Yes, she is. All right. 11, lying about money. It's difficult to talk about, tricky to share, and start many. Um, it it starts what? many arguments. <laughs> we'll start over. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready to be open as possible with all things cash related. If you lie about the amount of money you spend or, or your personal debt, this can be a problem. Yes, it can. Number twelve, trying to change them. We all have things we don't like about our partners, but if you sign up to be with someone, you gotta got bleh, you gotta go. And, she is throwing me off, I'm playing with my pen over there. <laughs> she's I feel like fun. she's gonna push a button. I can't even read properly. <laughs> Move, Moon. Okay, where was I? We all have things we don't like about our partners, but if you sign up to be with someone, you gotta. Go into it loving them just as they are. Mm -hmm. As Rappaport tells me, trying to change them or expecting them to change is just unfair. Mm. And 13. Picking on them or criticizing. Again, we all have these, we have things that we don't like about our partners. It can be tempting to let them know in the form of criticism or biting remarks. But we all know that never helps anything. One of the worst things you can do in a relationship is to criticize your partner, talk about their character flaws, or blame problems in a relationship on your partner's character defects. Mm. So looking at all 13 of those, was there anyone that like stood out to you? Um, I think they're all good points. I mean, not, nothing really stood out more than the other to me. I mean, it's all... They're all good points. Yeah, they seem pretty self-explanatory. Right. I mean, like I said, the title was Things You Should Never Do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. I feel like all of those things, depending on the severity, could have some bearings. Right. right. On exactly, you know, how yeah. things are flowing in relationships. I think the these, are, these are the core things that everybody tends to do. And that <laughs> causes a lot of issues. You right. know what I mean? Like, if you're not doing... Number 13, you probably do number eight. You might be doing number seven. You might be doing, you know. True. We're, we're always doing something, and each little bit affects a relationship greatly. So True. I completely understand. All right. Well, the second article we are going to run through today comes from KiraBradleyCounseling.com. Mm -hmm. It is entitled, Effective Boundaries Keep Your Relationship Strong and Healthy. So boundaries refer to limits that you put in place to protect your well-being. When boundaries are clearly communicated along with the consequences for breaking them, your mm -hmm. partner understands your expectations. In order to establish effective personal boundaries, you have to know yourself, communicate your boundaries to others, mm -hmm. and follow through with the consequences. Boundaries are for you and about you. They are about respecting your needs in a relationship and when you're uncomfortable about something in your relationship but don't speak up and share it with your partner resentment can build mm. here are some physical relationship boundaries 
or excuse me, here are some relationship boundaries to consider to help you keep your relationship strong. So the first one is physical boundaries. So physical boundaries obviously refers to your body, your privacy, and your personal space. And I think people don't understand a lot of times that you still should have those types of boundaries in, in a partnership or marriage. All right. People and think that like there's the, the status quo has always been when you get married, the woman belongs to the man, blah, blah. Yeah, and some people think, you know, it's like, well, I, I should be able to, to touch your elbows, you know? <laughs> Not if I say... But they're yeah. ashy, so... <laughs> So what? Don't talk about your elbows. I'm not talking about well, You're my definitely elbows. not talking about I'm mine. I'm not talking about my elbows. Moving right along. Uh, number two would be emotional boundaries. In order to establish emotional boundaries, you need to be in touch with your feelings. Healthy emotional boundaries require that you know, or you to know, where you end and your partner begins. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Number three would be sexual boundaries. Sexual boundaries refers to your expectations around physical intimacy. What is and isn't okay with your sex with, with you sexually. Right. Right. And number four is intellectual boundaries, intellectual boundaries. She's Jesus. jumping all over the place. <laughs> encompass ideas and beliefs boundaries around you showing respect for different views and ideas can keep your feelings from being hurt i agree with that uh last one is financial boundaries and that's a big one financial boundaries are all about money boundaries around joint versus separate accounts how much goes into savings, mm -hmm. which purchases you want to make, how much uh, discretionary funds mm -hmm. you will each have can keep you both on the same page where finances are concerned. Mm -hmm. that, yep. Yep. Now, when you think about all of these, how yeah. much of these do you think we have not done? I don't think we've set any boundaries. And that might be one of our issues that we never thought about it. Yeah, I guess it's... I guess what it is, I guess it's different when you have a best friend mm -hmm. versus coming into a relationship where that's like something to earn or gain or learn from another. You know what I mean? Like we take shortcuts. Yeah, we were best friends. And I mean, we knew everything. We kind of we kind of already like had this like thing where it was like. I know everything about her. She knows everything about me. So we just good. Yeah. But in reality, it's like that can that can come back and bite you in the butt sometimes. And it has. Where like little things will just come up like, well, I never really thought about or I never really, thought, you know. So I think it, I think yeah. it's important that you still, regardless of how good you think your relationship is, setting a boundary is literally everything. Mm -hmm. Not even just with a relationship with a spouse, but just with anyone, anyone, a friend, you know what I mean? Family, you know, anybody. And just all these categories, like you never think physical, emotional, sexual, intellectual, and financial mm -hmm. boundaries are all five different categories. Yes. And they can all yes. be five different types of arguments, yes. five different roots of a problem. Yes. So if you don't set all of them, which we never have. And I think that that is a big thing in, in so many people and communities that people think because I'm your friend, because I'm your mom, I'm your family, I'm your dad, that I could say and talk and touch you any way that I want. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we're taught to say nothing. Yes. It's like, if I want to hug you, I'm going to hug you because who I am to you. I'm family. Come on over here and give me. No. It's like, really? No, no actually. <laughs> I break out every time you hug me because that, <laughs> that perfume is terrible. It just messed me up. But you got to learn how to do that. Right. And then you do that. You set your boundaries. Like, we need to start teaching our kids. We need to start teaching other generations. Yeah. And even teaching our old generations who think they can't learn anything new to learn how to set boundaries. Yeah. Because like, they still do not do that. 100%. You know? Especially babies. Like, when you have a new baby and everybody wants to touch your baby. Right. I mean, honestly, right. for me, one of the great gifts that COVID has brought 
is it is teaching people personal boundaries regardless of who you are yes. that is the number one thing i know at the end of the day i don't want you touching me breathing on me or any of that before or after COVID. right and i know if my mom is listening to this right now she will be saying i didn't have any problem setting boundaries when i was little yeah because people always tried to touch me mess with me confused like i'm some kind of alien yeah what is it what, look, look look at him let me touch his head no and you know you give and your I said baby no and i said no <laughs> stop touching me don't mess with me i was really adamant at a very very young age yeah so i knew i wasn't gonna have a problem with that you know how you'll give your baby <laughs> to someone like can't go to auntie put yep and they yep. holding the baby and the baby screaming their head off babies are very close to the veil. Yeah. They have a very yeah. high intuition on those energies. If your baby's screaming and hollering every time you go to a certain family member, very you true. might want to look at the energies that that family member is bringing to the pot because clearly there's something going on there. Yeah, and a lesson for everyone out there, babies are more closer to your actual complete 100% self than you are right mm -hmm. now. Because the older you get, the more you forget who you were Yeah. before you came to this vessel. Exactly. <laughs> Just saying. But, um, yeah. 100 million trillion percent. So, we are actually going to cut to the break a little early today because we're coming down the wire in our book. And we've got lots and lots of good stuff to talk about in the 8080 marriage. So, enjoy this quick music break and we will be back in just a moment. I begin to pretend that it is, but it's for the love. Yet again.
Hey, we are back from the break, and that was guesswork from Vapors, available everywhere, and let me tell you, that's like one of my favorite songs ever. Yes, it is. Literally, like, it's just, the vocals just, you know. Alrighty, it's about that time for the book of the month. Once again, this month's book, again, is The 8080 Marriage, A New Model for Happier, Stronger Relationships by Nate and Kaylee Klimp. This week's assignment is the final two chapters of part three, which was called Building a New Structure, and that is part that, that is chapter 12 and 13. So let's just dive right into this. So chapter 12 is entitled Power. Who is in control so <laughs> being in a band is a lot like being in a marriage isn't that interesting <laughs> so it says how many faces of power or the, excuse me the many faces of power in a marriage so it started off uh, just to give kind of like some pretext um, they started talking about the game the game lord the the band queen mm -hmm. and freddie mercury and how like starting off freddie mercury and I, if i'm not mistaken uh, the bassist john deacon wait i'm not the bassist was it the guitarist mm -hmm. brian may wrote most of the early hits mm -hmm. so when they were doing you know like all the back end stuff with the financials basically what would happen is they'd have the whole pie mm -hmm. the people who were writing the song got half of the pie off up front Right. And then everybody else split the rest. So they always ended up with more. However, that ended up being a situation where as a whole, the morale of the group mm -hmm. was very low because at the end of the day, it kind of just, you know, when you just almost like are putting someone in their place mm -hmm. a little bit and not giving them the room to soar their wings and things like that. Right. So they kind of talked about the fact that well, in their later years, they actually squashed that. Mm -hmm. And um, they like there's one part where he said, I think Freddie and I squashed Roger and John in the beginning. We were the majority songwriters and we didn't give them enough say. Now it's totally equal. So because they right. kind of switched to being equal, it kind of changed the game for them. So how does power show up in marriage? When power falls out of balance, you feel like you're being controlled by another and not just any person. You're being controlled and pushed around by the person you decided to spend the rest of your life with. It's the perfect mm. setup for conflict and rage. Right. So let's see here. Where do I want to start? <laughs> so consider Michelle. It's a little story. She's an owner of several hair salons who significantly out earns her husband. I set up our system so that I would always have more power. And for some reason, I've always been attracted to men who have less power than me. This is what she's saying. Mm -hmm. Michelle admits that she both loves and hates having more power than her husband. I really like the financial control that I have, but I realize it's preventing us from feeling more joy. And so I often wonder, why don't I just loosen my grip on the power for a moment and stop holding it over his head? There are just a few of the ways power shows up in marriage of, uh, um, of the marriage of others. But the real question is, how does it show up in your relationship? 
What are the conflicts that arise from an imbalance in control, decision rights, or financial resources? Mm. So the indivis- the invisible force of power in marriage. Balanced power includes checks, balances, and ways to participate together in meaningful decisions, also that the system of the marriage leads to a shared success. Imbalanced power, on the other hand, is what happens when the dynamics consistently favor the interests of one person over another. Mm-hmm. Thoughts? Hmm. I, I, you know, it's kind of like going back to what, what you, uh, we kind of had something like this on the last, last week. Mm-hmm. You were talking about like being attracted to people who, you know, are less, you know, mm-hmm. adamant and then or dominant and you know what I mean? It's kinda mm-hmm. it's kinda like on the lines of that a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that's I think it's really interesting. Yeah. So there is something called the blowback rule. Mm-hmm. And it's a fancy way of saying that when you mess with your partner in the domain of power, they're going to mess with you back. Mm. So here's a couple <laughs> for an example. Right. It says they decided to build a house during the birth of their second child. Jim, who was the husband, ran the show. At the time, Donna was on bed rest in, at the hospital. So Jim picked the part of town. He picked the lot. He came back to her saying, here's a survey. Just trust me. This is where we should build the house. There was just one problem. The way this major life decision played out didn't sit well with Donna. She felt cut out of the process as if the critical decisions ended up being his and not at all theirs. So when the construction process for building their new home turned to putting the finishing touches on the house, Donna took over since he picked the location of the house. He always, um, and he's always traveling for work anyway. She thought I'm going to run the interior design my way. Now Jim took a back seat to the big decisions over countertops, furniture, light fixtures, kitchen appliances. They Mm -hmm. set a budget, but Donna felt justified in overspending because this was her show, not Jim's. And besides, Jen hadn't consulted her on choosing where to build a house or, so why should she consult him in the finishing touches of the construction? So this is called blowback in action, basically. We learn from Jim and Donna that when power goes out of balance, each resulting move comes like an act of war. Yeah. That's impossible to it's win. Like, it's like fighting back. Yeah. Yes. One yeah. that leaves both partners living with some of the most uncomfortable emotions in all of their married life. Resentment, anger, fear, and rage. Well, if you're going to buy more shoes, I'm going to get more purses. Yes. <laughs> that's blowback. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that definitely shows up. Yeah. I would say, you know. You should never like make a decision and just jump on it and be like, trust me, it's good unless you have that particular agreement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if we're picking a washing machine and you're like, I, you know, you, I put that in your hands. Mm -hmm. So I picked a washing machine. You pick where and how it's going to be set up and how's the laundry room and this and that and that and cosmetically this and that. You know, all the other stuff. So mm-hmm. it's like, that's, unless you have that agreement, if you don't, it's going to be a war. Yeah. It's going to be a war. Yeah. And that's, it's, that, that's really bad. So the best way to begin building this structure of shared success mm-hmm. is to look at a few of the areas in marriage where they tend to fall out of balance. The first is money. Mm-hmm. The second is around the house. And the third is sex. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the chapter is going to explore the first two questions. First one is financial power. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we learn is while money often creates imbalance, imbalances in power, it's not necessarily the cure for these imbalances. Instead, the cure is to design a new structure of power dynamics around the goals of shared success to manage money in a way that promotes rather than disrupts the experience of winning together. How can you do that? Consider two core principles. One is about how you save money as a couple, and mm-hmm. the other is about how you spend it. Right. Okay. Right. So the first one obviously is about shared success, meaning shared savings. Mm-hmm. 
So there's a couple of ways that they give basically to do that. The first way is all in. So basically what that means is if you want to go all in with shared success, then it means you do the whole like shared everything, bank accounts, investments, builds, debts, virtually everything. The second yeah. one, which I put a stash next, or I put a star next to you because this is my favorite, honestly, is side stashes. Some couples find that each still want a small pot of money separate from their shared accounts, money that they can spend freely. Because one thing we, we spent many years having joint accounts and what annoyed me is at the end of the day, I could always see what you do. Every time you bought an ed- edible arrangement, I saw it. <laughs> So how can you even surprise you can't you. surprise you? I mean, and I, you know, I hate surprises anyway. True, true. However, in reality, I don't see like if you're at work and somebody gives you flowers or like an edible yeah. arrangement, I don't, I don't even categorize those as surprises. They're like, just really like, <laughs> like do an edible arrangement is coming to you. You're like, oh, wow. Look at that. I had no idea. Literally, and literally you could be like, hey, remember <laughs> that bill's coming out and you just bought an edible ar- or anything. You know, it's just, stu- it's just stupid. So I just think that if you have an account that y- you both have access to, and that's the account that like the bills come in and things like that, but then you both have your own separate stashes. I just make, I think it makes life more adventurous. And then of course they have uh, separate finances with a joint stash. So basically for some people, yes. they have a specific account where they sh- save together, that's what but I was, they have their own separate account. I, I was going to say that's something I think. You like that one? I like that. More than the other one? Well, because. I feel like they're the same. Yes and no. The thing is that there's one in the middle. You know what I mean? There's something in the middle that of both they, though they but they both put yeah like for example if you get direct deposit in one I get direct deposit in another yeah and then there's a one in the middle where, where we put things, money in yes that's like a pot, I, that's like a pot. I agree with that so I mean kind of that's it's it the same thing I do agree with that fully so I guess we already agree on that mm-hmm. so the key is to make sure that you have at least some shared pool of funds some way of assure, uh, ensuring that you win makes your partner financially better off and that their win does the same for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So principle number two was around spending. So obviously these fights can suck the air out of communicate of connection and out of even the healthiest relationships. Mm-hmm. So the good news is that there are, uh, there are relatively straightforward solutions to this problem. Once, and we do have another uh, example couple here. So let's see here. Their names are Charles and Rita, a couple well aware of just how explosive the struggle over spending money can be. As Rita told us, I see couples all the time where one partner, usually the wife, feels controlled by her husband who has a higher income. Mm-hmm. To solve this problem, Charles and Rita created a budget. At the beginning of the year, they met and agreed how much they wanted to spend on various things. As Charles told us, this is a budget that goes down the line of items like my clothes, Rita's clothes, children's clothes, entertainment, home improvement, vacations, and Uber rides. So this exercise can be extremely difficult for higher earning partners. It requires them to be reasonable and generous. There are, after all, likely putting more money into the pot. So it requires that both partners agree to live within the constraints of the budget. Mm -hmm. So regardless of who makes more money, it's like, okay, our grocery budget for the month is X, Y, Z. And when we buy groceries, it needs to come out of this pot and be within this budget. Then it's like, regardless of how much you spend on groceries, nobody's getting upset because the budget's been set. Right. You know? So I think that's a good way um, of looking at it. And last but not least, when it comes to power struggles is domestic power, influence and control at the kitchen counter. (laughs) Kitchen counter. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So the struggle over household tasks, Mm -hmm. you might be thinking who wants to control housework? Isn't the whole battle for fairness is about getting the other person to take over more control, (laughs) but this power struggle surfaces over and over in our conversations with couples, many over 
contributing partners complain about doing so much around the house while subconsciously clinging to control over these tasks. One woman, for instance, told us that her husband feels it's unfair that he does so much work coordinating babysitters and house cleaners, but he's also unwilling to see control and let her take over. As she puts it, when my husband feels it's unfair, I tell him that I can't just com- that he can't just complain. He also has to relinquish control over the task to me, knowing that I might not be as good at it. Uh, and yeah. so far, yeah. he's unwilling to do that. So uh, he's mad that he's, he has to hoarding. do it. Yeah. Yes. And then mad that he's doing it, but hoarding at the same time. I know I have that issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do. So we won't even talk about it. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. When it's you, we're not going to talk about it. We can when talk about me, it. You talk all about, I'm just that kidding. goes back I'm to kidding. last week when we were talking about. Um, can't remember what it was called um but it was basically when you have an idea of a standard for something mm-hmm. and the other person doesn't meet your standard when they do it mm-hmm. so then you hold ownership of it but then you're mad that only you do it you know what i'm saying like i wish right. everybody in the house would clean the kitchen the exact same way right. then i won't feel like no i'll do it yeah yeah but until you get that until you get there then you can't you know what I mean? Right. It's just just how it goes. Yeah. So the remedy to these power imbalances is the same as the remedy to the money. Reorganize the structure of your life around shared success. Collaborate when scheduling important events and make important decisions. Reveal the truth about the and reveal the truth to your spouse. Yep. So there's also some, some great little um exercises that people can do in there so definitely if you're following along definitely um do some of those and you know let us know what you think of the little little uh, exercises and everything <laughs> now chapter 13 mm-hmm. this chapter makes me uncomfortable i don't like talking about shit like this okay chapter 13 is called mm-hmm. sex orgasmic altruism okay okay so I thought I would start this out by reading a story. And I think this is a very interesting story. So I'm just going to read through it and then we're going to kind of chat about it. Okay. So let me get comfortable. Chapter 13. Are you ready? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah. Okay. Blake sat at his desk in his dorm room, reveal, reviewing his notes for the next day of human biology midterm. It seems like this was going to be just like any other ordinary Tuesday night. That is until he heard an old school ding on his AOL instant (laughs) messenger. He looked up at his computer screen and Samantha 027 says, what are you up to? Samantha and Blake have been dating for six months now since the beginning of their junior year in college. He typed back, Just studying for human bio. Want to hang out? Samantha says, yes. Hiking up to the satellite dish beyond the campus? Question mark. 30 minutes later, sometime around 11 p.m., they parked their bikes and welcomed each other with a kiss. They approached the gate to the trailhead. It was locked and covered with signs reading no trespassing, no loitering, grounds closed after dark. Samantha scaled the fence first. Blake followed. They hiked together up the winding trail through an open meadow lit by moonlight. When they finally made it up to the top of the hill, they found a spot off the trail where they could lie down and gaze up at the stars. The view that night was unforgettable, dot, 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 and so was the (laughs) S-E-X. Now, then there was that time in their late 20s, six years into their marriage, Blake and Samantha decided to take an anniversary trip to Casamel. They spent their days together, walking on the beach, sleeping late, and exploring the island. On their last night, they walked a half a mile down the road to a small tiki-themed dance club on the beach. They rarely danced at home. They rarely stayed out late at a club. But tonight was different. Time disappeared. The music, the view, the warm ocean breeze, their connection to that night was amazing dot 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 and so was the s-e-x then there was last night 
now 13 years into their saying, marriage. Wait, wait, wait. We're <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> we're years in now. <laughs> Blake and Samantha are parents oh, to man. two boys. Yeah. Samantha has just returned home from a business trip to Chicago. Mm -hmm. Blake has spent the afternoon shuttling their two kids from school to soccer practice to trumpet lessons, all while taking conference calls from the sidelines of the soccer field, sending emails in the music school waiting room. With so much going on at 5 p.m., Blake texts Samantha, should we bail on date night? She texts back, too late to cancel the babysitter. At 9.30 p.m. after drinks, dinner with both kids in bed, they turn to each other. Blake mumbles sheepishly. So are we going to, you know. Samantha took a breath. I'm sorry, babe. It's just that I can barely keep my eyes open. It's been two (laughs) weeks since the last time we had. It's, it's. Blake protested. All right, let's just do this, Samantha said. Ten minutes later, they were both asleep. With so much stress, so much to do, and so little time to do it in, their connection that night was only okay. Dot, dot, dot. And so was the S-E-X. And that's it for Masterpiece Theater. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So, reading through that lovely sonnet that we just went through. Yeah. That story seemed like it just kept going downhill. As as the relationship gets further and further and and longer and whatever, a lot of stuff tends to come into factor, mm-hmm. and it it, get, it gets to the point where it's almost impossible to to rekindle those things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about the business. I'm thinking about money. I'm thinking about the kids. I'm thinking about you know what I mean? And it's like the last thing I'm thinking about is. Like what what we're trying to do because we don't have time for it because we're just so tired by the end of the, you know and yeah. it's like what we want to we do want to but it's just so freaking hard mm-hmm. you know later in, in 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 the years so I just feel like prioritizing that is very 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 important yes however there's another part that I thought was very interesting mm. okay. So it was basically talking about the fact that, you know, TV shows and things like that. And I'll just read it here. It says, what does the experience of sex often change so dramatically in marriage? Excuse me. Why? Mm -hmm. How does, how is it possible that it is most sensual and pleasurable to all human activities veer so quickly from lust or transcendence to just another box to check? Easy answer peddling to us by a glossy magazine with airbrush models on the covers is that this is a sex problem if we just had the right technique used the right toys acted out the right role play sex would go back to being just like it was in the early days instantly turning from mundane to mind-blowing there's only one problem with this comfort this conventional view it's the assumption that sex is somehow separate from the rest of life it is committed in, in a committed relationship, the idea that it's a sex problem assumes that the way things go in the bedroom almost has almost nothing to do with the way things went in the kitchen yesterday morning, on the way home from the office, or at the hug and go line at school. It's this assumption that leads to the strange yet wildly held idea that the only thing holding you and your partner back from an awesome from awesome sex is a Kama Sutra class, cherry flavored orgasm bomb, or a purple silicone vibrator shaped like a bunny rabbit. So it's impossible to seal off what happens in the bedroom during the most intimate moments from the rest of life. Far from being separate, sex is more like the mirror of your married life. Either mm-hmm. it reflects the strength of your connection mm-hmm. or it reflects past resentments misunderstandings and wounds how do you excuse me how you do life is how you do sex how you do sex is how you do life (laughs) thoughts on all of that that's deep very it's deep makes you think Mm -hmm. you know what i mean makes you think about that and try to put more effort into both of them yeah because they go hand in hand they go they coincide with each other yeah you know so that's interesting 
Yep, there is one single smoking gun problem responsible for the lackluster sex life. Rather, there are four complex interconnected problems keeping those of us in established relationships from experience, experiencing the joyful sex of our earlier years. Mm-hmm. First one is time scarcity. Most of us spend our days in constant state of doing. It's this always on state that is accompanying lackluster headspace and effectively destroying our desire to have sex. Mm -hmm. Number two, unrevealed resentment. If you're constantly keeping your mental tally of mental tally of who contributed more, who cares more, who's trying harder. We exist in a perpetual state of of, uh, irritation Mm -hmm. and resentment. Our boundaries and priorities aren't clear. And on top of that, we mostly have a mountain of emotional issues that we've never revealed or even discussed with each other. Yeah. Number three, the power struggle. The fact navigating the power in the bedroom can be one of the messiest challenges in a marriage. It's a challenge that often comes down to this one partner wants it and the other one doesn't. Yeah. And number four is mismatched expectations. So it's a lack of connection, the problem of mismatched expectations around sex. It says, what I see, I say, what I see is that porn and erotica have changed what we expect from our partner. You get this sense from it that everyone's available to have sex at any moment. And we've created a culture of unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. The real problem is that our expectations around it don't match our partners so many couples find it difficult to talk openly about these expectations right Mm -hmm. right so in the end loaded yeah in the end it all comes down to connection right so when connection deepens the emotional barriers start to fade right sex emerges as a natural expression of love and connection you don't want to surf random blogs and buzzfeed articles as you lie next to your partner you want to roll over and hold them so basically it's connection yep that's it so in order to get in the 8080 guide to getting it on they call it (laughs) step one solve life related problems and step two is to solve the sex related problems and they go on to give strategies they can say scheduling it doing challenges um turning rejection uh turn rejections into a plan etc etc lots of lovely little tidbits that you know you as the general public can definitely dive into when you are reading this book so that is my grand recap on chapters 12 and 13 boom the very ending (laughs) part to part three which is building a new structure and what's crazy to say is this coming week will be our final week with the final two chapters of the book so this week's reading assignment will be chapters 14 and 15 of part four that's deep i know so we're almost done with this book yep all right <clears throat> so now we are going to go to pick a card any card <laughs> once again we're back at the best self intimacy deck and let's recap the categories it's about you intimacy relationships past life and random and I think it's my so turn. today's pick is yes it is your turn because i feel like i pick every week but yeah. it's okay I'm tired of you. I'm tired of you picking about you. You've done it. I, no, I haven't. I do I've the done all of them. I've, I, you do, I do the recaps. I've seen. I've done all of I've them. I've seen. Okay. I'm picking past. I don't think we've done this we one We did yet. pass. That was the first one I picked, I think. No, we did. Yep. <clears throat> I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. So, here I go picking the card. So, Past. What <laughs> I never can answer these. <laughs> I can't I can't answer <laughs> I this either. I I'm gonna repick. No. I'm gonna read it, well, but yeah. I'm gonna repick. Yeah, read it. What is then... the most illegal thing you've gotten away with? 
Oh, I mean, that's not That's even. stupid. So let yeah, me pick another gonna, one. We're not going to. All right, here we go. Illegal. Is there Illegal. any history of addiction, abuse, or negative habits in your family? How has that affected you? No, that's that's another one that's not really because we don't have that. Okay. Yeah, that's another one that's not. So here we go. This one is the one. What did your past relationships teach you about love and partnership? Nothing. That it doesn't exist. Nothing. Moving right along. And that's that. <laughs> For our segment of pick a card, any car. That burr, was burr, just burr, very uh, burr, burr, uneventful. Burr, 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 burr. I know you like my game show. Music. No, no. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Well, it is about that time. Next topic. It's time to draw for the next topic of the week. Can I get a drum roll, please? I thought I was supposed to pick. I haven't picked one. Forever. You're about to pick. I'm just shaking. I know, but I never get Can to shake I the cup. Can I shake? Can I shake the cup? Here, shake on. I don't shake the cup. Okay, now I feel like I have power. <laughs> pick a damn. Pick a piece of paper. Lord. All right. Read it out loud for the class. Read it out loud for the class. Fusing into one person. <laughs> that should be interesting. Well, uh, some uh, people uh, are uh. like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? And they'll find out next week. You know? We're going to just leave them like that, huh? Yes, we are. Well, I guess that does it for this week's podcast. And all of the articles you will be in the description box and the links below and the book of the month as well the 8080 marriage and thank you for tuning in to today's podcast be sure to like comment and subscribe and of course ignite, ignite your, your energy, energy.